Hi, friends. Welcome back to First Church of God. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I've got a title for this message today. It's called Undesirable. Hmm, interesting. I hope you get into this. Uh, if you have children, and we have a restaurant, a fairly new restaurant here in Cushing. It's called Philly Homa, and I found them in a couple other locations here in Oklahoma. It's pretty much an exclusive place to Oklahoma. But they have a children's menu. And on their children's menu, these are the things that you can order. These are the titles of the uh, item that you might want. I don't want that. That's the grilled cheese sandwich. Or I want McDonald's. That's a regular cheeseburger. Uh, then there is, can I have your phone? That's a regular kid size hamburger. Or there is, I'm not hungry, which is chicken tenders. And finally, I'm bored, which is macaroni and cheese. Kind of funny. But if you have children, if you ever cooked for children, uh, you know that sometimes they can be a little picky eaters and they don't really want what you are cooking. Or if they come in the kitchen, kitchen while you're cooking, they might say, I don't think I'm going to like that. What they're saying is that's undesirable. And when I was growing up, we always had two choices, take it or leave it. Um, but sometimes we don't like what is in front of us food-wise because maybe it's a texture thing. Maybe it's something that we've had that we don't like, like coleslaw. Um, different things that we don't like. But as we mature, uh, there are some things that we say are undesirable. Sometimes our kids will say they were undesirable. Uh, my children learned that they had to take the no thank you bite and, and try it so they might learn something. Um, but we're not just talking about food. There are things in life that may seem a little bit undesirable. And that, um, Maybe when you were growing up, you weren't the most athletic person in school. And on the playground, when it came to kickball or something of that nature, you were never picked first. You were always picked last. I think that what we should have done is just made it easier and just put me on the last team. Just take how many people there are, divide it into two, and say, okay, you go over there, you go over there. Because we're going to be the consolation player. And that's okay. Um, we could have had more time on the playground if we would have divided before we even started. Being picked last can make you feel lonely. All the lonely people, the Beatles said, where do they all come from? All the undesirable people, where do they all come from? I want you to imagine for a minute, and a friend of mine uh, was sharing this with me. Imagine you are sitting across from Jesus. You're sitting face to face with Jesus, knee to knee with Jesus, toe to toe with Jesus. And you're sitting there with him and he asks, he says, ask me anything. Ask me anything. What would you ask Jesus? I don't know. For me, I don't think it'd be an easy, an easy answer. I think I would be mumbling because I, I could not imagine being in his presence and him asking me, what do you want to know? What can I tell you? Maybe we're saying, am I doing okay? Did I do a good job? What do we want to hear? What would you ask him? What would you want to know? What would be you be what would you be afraid that he might bring up? Our desires ought to be we want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Much better than, do I even know you? So what would you want Jesus to say to you? In the pages of scripture, they, they're filled with uh, people who uh, we would say they were last picked. They were undesirables of society. They were overlooked. They had bad reputations. The, the ones your mother warned you to stay away from because bad company corrupts good character. In Joshua, we have a woman by the name of Rahab. She is mentioned eight times in scripture. And out of those eight times she is mentioned, her occupation is mentioned with five of those. I wonder what drove her to that lifestyle because it says Rahab, the prostitute. Rahab, the prostitute. What happened to cause her to sell herself? She is not the only one who um, has a bad reputation to be tossed aside, to be the last pick, to be undesirable. One day Jesus and his disciples were walking in the middle of the day and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to sit down here at the well. You guys go into town, you get some food and come back. And while he's sitting there in the middle of the day, this woman comes up and this woman is one of those people that, oh, man, she's undesirable. Uh, Jesus does the unthinkable. 
He stepped across racial lines. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He stepped across the gender lines. He was a man. She was a woman. They weren't to speak to each other. He, he stepped beyond the boundaries of the town. He spoke to this woman who was working on hum, husband number six, but had left number five, four, three, two, one. And she is remembered as a woman of the undesirable club. People talked about her. In the Old Testament, we have Hosea. And God says to Hosea in uh, chapter 1, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a prostitute, uh, a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Go marry Gomer, daughter of Debalam, and she conceived and bore him a son. You read the rest of the chapter, she has two more children, but it never says that he that, that she bore him a daughter or she bore him another son. It just said she had more children. This one with a questionable past kept questions coming. The undesirable makes some wonder and others wander. One day, Jesus is questioned about the woman who was caught naked and up to no good, and the Pharisees were about to stone her. And they saw her uh, sin, and Jesus reminded them of their own sin. They used her and were trying to use her to trap him, and he set the undesirable free. Others looked at these four undesirable women as well as others, and they talked. Stephen Tyler said the reason a dog has so many friends is that it wags its tail instead of its tongue. The one in the margin with a mess became the one with a message. The undesirable became unchained. The woman at the well in John chapter 4 verse 28, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and they made their way toward him. She came looking for water. She couldn't carry the water jar back in her arms because they were overflowing with the grace of God. Gomer left Hosea and she went back into prostitution, back into promiscuous living. And one day there was going to be this auction and God says to Hosea, go get her back, go buy her back. And at the city dump of humanity, she stood on the auction stage. Lone numbers were being shouted from the crowd. She looked to the ground ground, the dirt reminded of her past, and she probably felt that she wasn't worth much more than dirt. And as she looked at the ground, God looked at her future. And when God looked at her future, he looked at us at the same time. Rahab, the prostitute, was looked down upon, who she let down, lifted her up. The woman caught in adultery asked Jesus, Jesus asked, where are your accusers? Gather up your dignity and my grace. Now go and sin no more, because I don't condemn you. We can say that these women didn't have the greatest of reputation, but think of the man, a bad man, who would be called a criminal. His reputation was worse than uh, the, these women. When these women walked into public, people talked behind closed doors about them. When this man stepped into town, everyone ran and hid as if they were cockroaches and somebody turned the light on. They, they were afraid that they would be another notch on his pistol belt, another number in his book of those who were part of the way and had been in his way, and he took them out of the way. Paul had uh, had more believers put to death because of their faith than most uh, anyone else. His name struck fear in their hearts and everybody around. You know, like these women, when they were unwanted, when they were last picked, when they were avoided and outcast, when they were undesirable, God stepped in with grace and God caused the walls of Jericho to fall and Rahab to walk out of the prison of her past. The woman in the street, she was in the genealogy of Jesus, the woman in the street to stand up and to regain her dignity. Gomer, uh, he gave a second chance to, and the woman at the well, she, he gave a ministry to, and Paul went on uh, from, went from murderer to messenger. That's what grace does. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, 
the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith, the woman in the street wasn't stoned because uh, she was granted forgiveness. By faith, the woman at the well uh, forgot her water jar and carried a message that no one could believe and was given to her. By faith, Gomer's past was ignored and her future was embraced. By faith, Paul left his old life and found new life. By faith, Peter became a, a, the great, one of the greater disciples of Jesus. After he denied Jesus, he became the greatest disciple. Your past may be your history you would like to never repeat and for everyone to forget um, and everyone to never bring up. Maybe your family and your friends don't share your faith. When my family, my grandmother's family, my grandma Klaus family, they came to the America, their last name was Swain, but that wasn't their real last name. Their real last name was Van Pelt. And somebody within the family had committed a crime and they were trying to hide him by changing his name. And Swain stood for Society with Holy Allegiance in Monarchs. There are other skeletons in your family closet, my family's closet. And I'm sure it isn't about pedigrees of our past or the relatives of rebellion that define us. Our role models are people with questionable past, but exciting futures. We don't need to be on an auction box, tossed a, a scarlet ribbon out the window, or forgot a water jar. We need to trust in the stranger as these people did. If you are sitting face to face with Jesus, toe to toe with the Savior, knee to knee with the all-knowing one, what would you want him to say? What do you hope he does, doesn't bring up? You will always want to silence the thing that can destroy you. What is the skeleton in your closet? What do you want no one to know about? The truth is going to come out. Here's the good news. Jesus is able to forgive that. Jesus is able to empty out the closet and still love you. And before you break out in a sweat and in a panic, the fact that God forgave and used Rahab, God forgave and used the woman at the well, God forgave and used the woman that was caught in adultery, God forgave and gave her a new opportunity. Gomer found her true value. Paul was given new life. In fact, God's is that... Paul was given new life, and that is the fact that God is into forgiveness. God's forgiveness shows that he's more interested in building a relationship than he is with a bunch of rules. When the prodigal son returned, he, he wanted a career, and he found a connection. He, he, he was afraid of rejection, but he found a relationship. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he says, or do, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That's the relationship. Jesus wants to build with you and with me. If you think these five were outcast, or even Peter or anybody else were outcast by their choosing, they didn't seek God. They didn't seek a relationship. The relationship came to them, which shows me that Jesus is all about relationships, and he is coming again. He is coming again. Only one and her family were saved in the destruction of Jericho. Hosea is a true story, but it's also a parable for us to see how God doesn't give up on what he loves. He loves what he creates, and he chose us before the creation of the world. We have a choice. We can look and dwell in our past, our mistakes, our failures. They are the distractions that rob us of hope. But Jesus is our hope. And if you receive him as your savior, you have a hope. And the scripture says faith without actions is dead. The powerful thing about coming to know Jesus and following him and walking in his way is your mess becomes a message. God's team is full of the world's last choice. The humanity, uh, the humanity consolation players the undesirables, and all that are MVPs, all those are MVPs to them. That is amazing grace. Grace is God not treating us as our sins deserve and the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells this parable in John in Luke chapter 15. And I'm just going to read a few verses here. It says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home and goes home and goes home. 
Do you see that the lamb was redeemed, rescued by and for love, and the good shepherd rescued the lamb? The value of the lamb was more than just property. It is a treasure worthy the risk of rescue. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 24, he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world worthy of the lamb wandering into danger again, brought into safety for freedom. With those undesirables I mentioned earlier, notice something that they all have in common. Just like the lamb, the shepherd came looking for them. Rahab had two spies coming into the land and they found her. Uh, while the others uh, um, saw her as undesirable, God saw her as worthy. Gomer, God told Hosea, redeem her. He saw the value with a, a vision of her future. The woman in adultery, Jesus, showed up at the right time, at the right place, so she could have a right relationship and so that she could be going somewhere else. When others thought he was taking a break from traveling, Jesus stopped to turn an undesirable's life into a new direction for his own glory. And notice throughout scripture how God the Father is always seeking what was lost. And some of the lost, the undesirables, didn't even realize that they were lost or undesirable. They just knew something was missing. Undesirables are uh, uh, desperate. They are hurting. And, uh, and hurting people hurt people. Hurting people are unpredictable. They are at the end of the rope. They might be backed into a corner, and it is the largest, sh it's as if the largest shop vac in the world has hooked into their life, and all of the hope has been sucked out of them. For some, the undesirables, Jesus showed up at the right place at the right time and brought the right to become children of God. Others, he sent somebody else. Some, he sent a bright light. Who are you? Are you undesirable? Well, let me give you the good news. He's been looking for you. He has come to where you are. You can't get good enough on your own. You need him. Knowing Jesus and being delivered from the undesirable club is simple. You ask him to forgive you of your sin and come into your life. And then you move from the outskirts of the outcast into the family where you're meant to be. For those who knew Jesus as Savior, for those of you who know Jesus as Savior, there are people you know who others have called the outcasts, the undesirables, but those are really sheep that Jesus is looking for. And the way he wants you to reach them is send spies. You are the spy. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then verse 6, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Then he says that this is how, so he says this so that we can become the flesh of Jesus. He says, verse six, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. To set captives free, we love them. We don't tell them how wrong they are or how bad they are or how far away they are. We say, I love you. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And how do you know, how, who do you know that comes across your mind that you say, they seem undesirable, unwanted, no good, dirty, hungry, imprisoned, naked? How are you praying for them? How can you pray for them? What is one way that you can express love to them for Jesus this week? Thank you. Blessings.